It's time for round six in the Real Racers Virtual Club spring season in the Formula 3 cars. And we head then from the land down under to the land of the rising sun and the free track that is Okayama. Wonderful to be back here live on Racebot TV once more on a Tuesday night. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati and alongside for today's action is Nolan Remble with Hugo Louise down in the production booth controlling all of the action. Uh, live timing is available at timing71.org where you can follow along with the best in the real and virtual worlds of motorsport using their world-class suite of data analysis tools with additional TV cameras provided to us by Istvan Ballo and trackcams22.com. And Nolan, last week was the first time that we covered this series on Racebot TV and what a treat we were in for for Philip, Philip Island. It was very exciting, but round six from Okayama, this will be a very different type of a race. It'll be interesting to see how some of these drivers who have a lot more experience in the real world adapt to the simulator. Oh, absolutely, Arjuna. This track is certainly a whole different challenge than Phillip Island. It's a lot tighter for one thing, not to mention a pretty slow track as well compared to the Australian track from the land down under. It's uh, definitely one of the more technical tracks you got out here on the surface, and it's a great track to actually learn on as well and kind of hone your skills as a driver. In fact, it's a series very popular in some of the lower down series you can find on the official series from iRacing. I do like that after a double header, we stay in Asia, uh, or at least this side of the globe, uh, for this round of the championship. Take a look at these drivers' standings. We are six races through the 11 round championship. Only the top nine points will count at the end of the season, but we still have to get towards those final couple of races to really think about the drop points. It's still quite close at the front of your field. You've got Rick Sheldon leading from just five points from Matthew Escajeda. Escajeda with two victories on the season so far, Nolan. A Sheldon with just one, but he's been a lot more consistent. An average finish of third on the season so far. Definitely an average finish that you want to have. Just goes to show that sometimes having yourself all the wins in that win column is not really everything uh, in the overall story. You got some series as well where you'll get drivers that they either finish first or they finish last. So I did mention it at the start. A lot of these drivers have experience in the real world, and we've got an interesting mix of drivers with professional-level motorsports experience, Stefan Wilson being one, of course. Uh, he's got other attentions to deal with today. The month of May well and truly underway as he tries to qualify his way into the Indianapolis 500. Just a few minutes left in practice. Now let's talk about some of these other drivers, though, with lots of that real-world experience. There's John Showerman in the 13 machine. He's got experience in F3 cars dating back to about six years ago, Nolan. But more interestingly for me, uh, over the last couple of years, he's headed over the pond into Europe, competing in the Le Mans Cup in an LMP3 car. He's actually raced at the famous Circuit de la Sarthe, and you can see there on the right-hand side of the screen, the picture looks like an uh, ELMS weekend there at Paul Ricard. I do believe he actually took a victory at the most recent race that he took part in, which happened at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia. And it's seemingly taking that win in style, too. That is a beautiful-looking LMP3 machine just there on the right side of the screen. Uh, those cars are definitely far from easy to control, so the fact that he's able to be extremely competitive in that series is definitely a big testament to his skill. It's uh, definitely an extremely competitive series, one of the more competitive multi-class series that you can find around the world. Now based in Scottsdale, Arizona, so that's an interesting trip for him over the pond to Europe, but I'm sure enjoying himself a lot. Take a look at some other drivers with experience. Here's Jeremy Clark, a, a California native down in Manhattan Beach. Uh, been dipping his toes into the Ferrari Challenge with this uh, wonderful teal Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo with the hope, Nolan, to step it up into the GT3 cars. And this is what this series was kind of devised around. You've got drivers like this with aspirations of stepping on up in the motorsports ladder but you've also got drivers uh, the butler boys for example you know they've got track day cars they take it out to the tracks you know, fairly frequently and very rapid drivers in their own right all coming together just uh, trying to get to be the fastest driver that they can and the fact that Jeremy Clark wants to make that step up into the G33 machinery is definitely a good sight to see. There are, of course, a lot of places where you can go when it comes to G33 racing. Of course, the very top of the calendar, among them being the GT World Challenge, uh, that is definitely one of the higher uh, uh, series up that races at so all sorts of famous tracks all over the world, including, of course, the Circuit de Spa de Francochamps, Circuit de Barcelona Catalunya, and more. And, well, we mentioned it last week, and we played a rather interesting video about Stefan Wilson and his uh, quest to qualify once more for the Indy 500. 35 cars entering for the qualifying weekend, which is 33 cars. Uh, 
getting through to the three wide start that I'm sure everyone wants to be on. Let's take a look then at his uh, 2021 ride for the Indy 500. Lola Sport on board as a sponsor. Uh, of course, being powered by the Andretti Autosport team. You've also got a number of uh, logos that we'll be able to talk about in more detail. The likes of Turn 2 Racing, uh, part of the, the community that I think is around this series as well. You've also got uh, the Track Day Club that Rick Sheldon is founder of. So, so many different partners coming together on that car. And I think this is really a community series, Nolan, that we are going to really enjoy covering here on RaceBot TV. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we saw just how thrilling that first race ended up being. Uh, the second race, we're hoping, will be a thriller as well. One more car in this field, of course, that we had in the last race. So 13 total going to be attempting to make the start here today. Qualifying getting underway, and everybody is coming out of pit road in one long train. Just now throwing themselves up for the Atwood Curve. Going to be 15 minutes then to set their fastest lap times in this Formula 3 car. Uh, this is a track that has hosted Formula One competition. It was opened in 1990 uh, as a private motorsport track for the wealthy, almost kind of like the Virginia International Raceway, a private motorsports resort. But then 1994, 1995, saw so Formula One uh, come here to Okayama for, for two rounds of that championship, named the Pacific Grand Prix. Uh, you go back in the history books, you'll actually find the Pacific Grand Prix only ran on, on tracks that are free on the iRacing service. Laguna Seca, as well as this track here. Both times that Formula One came here, Nolan, a, a certain name, a German, uh, came out on top. Michael Schumacher, uh, he, he's also got the lap record here. I'm taking a look at the notes that I had written down for me. I think it was a 113. Don't think we're going to see that type of lap times here today in the Formula Three cars. Let's see how close uh, these drivers can get, though. After a slight mistake from uh, Kurt Pensagrau just on the exit of the Hobbs corner, that is going to see uh, Zach Hudson now head up the train, and he'll be the first driver to get in that fully timed lap. It's a 129.4, but of course, our finish sits on the exit of Pit Road, so the lap times that we're seeing falling down here are definitely not representative of what we're going to be seeing in this qualifying session. So now these drivers are on their first proper qualifying laps. So in through this right-hand hairpin, build up the speed down the back straightaways. Showerman goes up to provisional second. We are looking like the current fastest lap time at 128, 159. You see the spread of lap times down to almost three seconds back to Hayden Fisher in the three. Uh, Fisher was pretty rapid at Phillip Island. We'd expect those times to close on on up. And uh, we were talking about it before we came on air, Nolan. This is a track which uh, the draft is not necessarily going to be as important, you see. Uh, the number two car running wide in through the double left-hander, and there's a car trying to slip down his inside as well here through qualifying. Uh, you could be pretty racy here, despite the fact that you won't have that draft, and that's Zach Hudson making a mockery of the first of these switchback hairpins. And Kurt Pensagrau, as you had seen, also ran wide, just in between the revolver and the Piper corners, and that really actually compromised uh, Robert McGinnis in the number eight car, who now heads up the train as we see Hudson come back on track, and... McGinnis going to now come across the line. He's on provisional pole for now. Will he definitely improve on his time? The answer is absolutely yes. Almost a four-second gain. And McGinnis now on provisional pole. Max Butler, six, uh, six provisional second. Just two tenths of a second behind. Well, the first lap times weren't really representative. Just the cars building up the speed. And I think in some cases, it was also their outlaps as well. So 124s as we jump on board with the Hot Wheels machine. I tell you what. Uh, let's ride around here with Dave Anderson for a lap at the Yokoyama circuit. It's a relatively fun track, and uh, everyone who gets accustomed to the iRacing service starts, uh, at least on some car over here as well, across the start-finish line to start a just under four-kilometer lap into the very descriptively named first corner. Uh, break a bit early and sweep your way down through the right-hand hairpin, but set yourself up on this right-hand side to use as much of the inside curve in through Williams and turn two. Oh, Anderson loses the rear end, so we're not going to get a full lap there, but it's a tricky corner getting the power down, and you can see the car dancing on the edge of adhesion. Now, here's Matt Escajeda coming through that very same complex of callers, Nolan, and guess what? Same mistake there in the number one car. That is by far one of the most tricky corner conferences you got on this track, and it's the one place you always want to look out for. I have a feeling what's happening here, these drivers are just starting to barely nick the inside curves, and that they're turning in just a little too much. It's very, very easy to overcompensate for the corners, especially when you're in these Dallara Formula 3s that have so much downforce on them. 
you gotta use so much caution when you're going through that series of corners. I mean, even in a Global Monster MX-5, you will find yourself definitely having all sorts of struggles through that corner. Max Butler improves. He will go three tenths behind McGinnis now, who now has a 123.711 on board of Nicholas Leo, who's now darting his way through the middle section of the racetrack, coming down to the Piper corner, where the track kind of splits off with the shorter circuit, keeps it in tight, and now he's going to keep it right up, right next to the right sideline here. Coming up for the Redman corner, the first of the two switchback hairpins, going to dive it in. Now he's got to hug the left side of the track and really set himself up for that right-hander of Hobbs corner. Don't be, uh, you gotta be careful though, not to get too much throttle on the exit. That's another very easy mistake to make as we throw on ourselves up for the Mike Knight corner. And now, <laughs> e e equally descriptive final corner here. It's literally called the last corner. Turn 11 onto the power. You can see running wide. Not sure how much we'll see cars using all of the gravel there as well, because you can take a little bit of it and carry your momentum. For Leo, not necessarily the fastest lap time. Five minutes done in this qualifying session. There is Max Butler, provisional second, coming through in through the final sector. Two corners left to go in the 10. Three tenths down and with his brother right behind him on the timing sheet. He will come through this final corner in the wonderful number 10 car. Hey, you can see using all the track on offer as that's Kurt Panzegru losing the rear end of his car uh, through the final corner at the line. It's a 123.006 for Max Butler. That puts him seven tenths clear of the rest of the field there, Nolan. Oh, that really is a scorching lap time. Seven tenths up and over a second from one Butler back to the other. Now we're on board with Joe Butler here, 1.1 seconds behind. Can Joe Butler overtake his brother Max? So we'll have to see here. Butler through that final corner. Oh, he's run wide onto the gravel, so he will not be getting in that lap time. Joe Butler will have to settle for third for now. Still has eight and a half minutes, though, to get a lap time in here. These guys said about one and a half minute lap times just underneath that, so you definitely have time for a few more flying laps if you open on the circuit. A lot of these drivers, though, definitely seem to be struggling for grip here early on our June and qualified. Definitely uh, a sight that was very unlike what we saw at Phillip Island. You reckon maybe the track temperatures have something to do with that? I was just taking a look. It's 36 degrees. Not necessarily sure that's such a factor. It's in that sweet spot of not too cool, not too warm. You're not going to have to worry about overheating your tires necessarily. We're on board with the eight car in through the first of the left-hand 90-degree corners into the final sector here. Second place and a seven-tenths adrift. Can he do something to improve on his lap time and close on a number 10 car that leads the timing sheets? Only eight minutes left, so starting to run out of time here. And Rather big separation between some of the cars. The top 10 just separated by two seconds now as Butler goes even quicker. A 122.773. He has set the afterburners to maximum. Here comes McGuinness then through the final corner. Can he respond as Rick Sheldon slides his way up to third? Jeremy Clark up to second at the line. It's a 123.203. McGuinness goes up to second, but he's still a four tenths off as there goes Zach Hudson up to second. The times are coming in thick and fast. Still, though, at the top of the boards, Max Butler definitely the driver to beat, but Zach Hudson hot on his heels, four tenths of a second back. He has got to find some extra speed, so he's going to kind of dart his way through the left hand uh, sweepers here, through the Moss S, down for the Atwood curve, and gets on the throttle at just about the perfect time on the exit. The corner really widens up on the exit, which allows him to get a really great run down the straightaway. He's also got a small bit of track to help from John Showerman just up the road in that number 13 machine, which is definitely helping him gain some time down the longest straightaway on the track. Oh, but locks up the inside front as he tries to get his way down onto the apex. Four tenths off a pole position. What can uh, Zach Hudson do? Owner of three motorcycles, likes to participate not just in racing uh, road car track days, but in motorcycle track days as well. In towards Redmond, the first of the hairpins in this final sector. Now through Hobbs, uh, the trickier of the two if you ask me, because you need to get the power down in towards Mike Knight corner, which is uh, really just about hanging on. Lift off as little as you can and sling that car down into the final corner. 117 as does not use all of the track on offer there. Got the draw from the 13 at the line. It's going to be not better. 123, 426. He's got six minutes here, Nolan, to maybe regroup and, and, and find some more clean air because he's starting to get a little bit close and, and dirty air will start to affect him that much more. 
Dirty air is, of course, uh, a factor that plagues a lot of drivers in these open qualifying sessions. It's always something this guy's got to struggle with. I mean, in a, a majority of not just IRC leagues, but also official series as well, you do run private closed qualifying where you don't have to worry about dirty air. Of course, very different situations here in qualifying. If I were some of these guys that have already been out there for a few laps, I would consider coming on down, getting a fresh set of tires, take that extra lap, get them all warmed up, and then go for your one flying lap right just before the clock can expire. That's a, usually a very popular strategy, especially in open wheel cars. So some more lap records that I've just been taking a look at here. The Formula One lap record set back in 1994. That was the year I was born. That is just an incredible amount of time uh, for a lap record to stand. A 114.023. That was Michael Schumacher in the Benetton B194. Super Formula uh, just in 2020. That was Nick Cassidy. Always quick, no matter what car you throw Cassidy in. 115.237 there. That gives you an indication of just how developed a Super Formula car is uh, compared to a modern F1 machine. Pole position, a 122.773. As Zach Hudson does improve up into second. Now just two tenths separating first and second. It's getting closer and closer. Uh, but the Super Formula lights, uh, Nolan, that would be an interesting comparison as Hudson all sorts of wrong through turn two. He'll have just four minutes to head back out onto track and set a faster lap time. That lap record, a 122.439 in the Dallara 320 uh, machine. Slightly different to the Formula 3 that these cars are the cars that are out on track right now, but we are right on pace, I would think, with some of the most competitive young Japanese superstars in modern motorsport. And again, that just goes to show just how these guys are putting that real race of experience to work. You got guys over here that have run in USF 2000 cars, Formula 3 cars, even in the real world. These guys know what they're doing in these types of machines. They have raced competitively in the real world. You got guys trying to work their way up in the GT3 series. You got guys that are on prototypes over in Europe, in European Le Mans series. It's, it is such a competitive series and it's full of such a diverse set of drivers here across all sorts of road course racing backgrounds. But I think that just adds to the feeling of this league. Shaver kind of backs off a little bit before that last corner. I think trying to set himself up to get a massive blast of speed down this front straightaway. He's trying to go for another flyer this time by. He'll have two opportunities still to do so. Open qualifying means you do get to finish the lap that you're on when the checkered flag flies. So let's see what's going on here. YouTube chat, as always, we will interact with you. Wes Johnson uh, saying that Zach Hudson thinks that he's a pod racer uh, from the Star Wars days. And I do believe Zach Hudson is a, a big fan of, of Star Wars. And of course, in the month of May, uh, may the force be with him here today. He has met the likes of Harrison Ford, George Lucas, and so many more. Favorite character is Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm sure he'll be excited about the upcoming uh, series that is going to be live on Disney Plus, hopefully in 2021. I'm excited for that one too. I know Hudson is equally excited about the Indy 500 that's coming up this weekend. This will be his 10th Indy 500 that he will be attending in person. On board with Butler though with the Max Eru number 10 riding through the penultimate corner to start what might be one of his final qualifying attempt at the line what's it gonna be can he improve the 122 773 uses all of the track on offer 22 and climbing it's a 22 382 once more manages to chop three tenths off his lap time there nolan he's now half a second clear from Menegis in in second position Max Butler has this car dialed in. He knows exactly what he's got to do. He just had one lap uh, compromise, had a close call with Dave Hollers, who just had a spin, put out on track. Hollers still has yet to set a qualifying lap in this session. Zach Hudson, meanwhile, coming through the second half of the lap now. Can he improve? He's already down to fourth place now. Schaumann's in second, McGinnis in third. What can the number nine car do for either of them, though? Can he put himself onto the front row? You'll get the time to finish the next lap as well. So for Hudson, not the final bite of the cherry. It's a 12 and counting. He's backing himself up, I do believe, for that final flying lap. And there you can see, onto the power. Here he comes. The eight car improves slightly. It's now just over a tenth of a second separating the front row of the grid. And Showerman finds himself quite adrift on the inside of row number two. Working their way through Moss Corner, I believe that's the eight car, all black, not very colorful. It'll make it slightly easier to identify here today. There's Showerman coming through. You'll get one more lap as well here, Nolan. What can he do this time around? 
John Showerman's got half a second. He's got to improve on Max Butler if he wants to take away a provisional pull. The question is, is that going to stand? He also still will have time for one more lap after finishes this one off. So is he going to make this lap count? Is he going to set himself up for the next lap? Cutting it in tight for the last corner. Apex blasting on to the front straight away. What can Sharma do? He's got a 122.886 for now. Can he get it across the line? 125.594. So definitely no dice. I believe that may have been an outlap. Still will have this time around. I believe Hayden Fisher is in the wall through turn two. There you can see uh, that car is stricken. In fact, no, that's Dave Holler is in the 769 who has not set a qualifying lap time just yet. The only car in the field. Uh, to have done so. Checkered flag waves then, so the cars will be allowed to finish their lap they are on, but no more here in qualifying. Round six in the spring Formula 3 season. It's Butler at the top with the eight car in second, and the 13 start on the inside of row number two. I, that, I believe that was the eight car that's finished, so three tenths adrift. That will be the best he can do. Watching Showerman working his way through. I believe Max Butler is also done here. So what can the 13 car do? And there you can see Butler has stopped on the inside of Piper Quarter. At a spin, so that comes by his final lap. So John Showerman up to third. Six tenths back. Can he potentially have a run here at provisional pole? He still has over six tenths. Of the no, he can't! Spins it out of the exit of one of the double switchback hairpins. And that is going to put John Showerman out of the race. Backs it hard into the wall. Now the question comes for Zach Hudson, what can he do? Anderson puts himself up to third in the number 62 machine, but still over six tenths back from your current pool center, Max Butler. The top two are well and truly flying for, I think the rest of the field, it will be about damage limitation. So we will wait then for the final moments of qualifying to come to a close. Still a couple of cars, I think out there with the opportunity to finish a flying lap time. There's Hayden Fisher. He was quick last time out. It's a 20 and counting at the line. This is quick. This is really quick. Faster than he's done before. Still a second adrift. He will stay where he is. Here's Hudson. Not going to improve either then, Nolan, because he's gone a bit loose coming through that final corner. And with that, that might just do it. You do have Nicholas Leo coming across the line, but he has uh, definitely been... Uh, some ways off on the cars previous to him. He comes across the line. It's a uh, well, it's not going to really be any improvement there for Nicholas Leo in the number 69 machine. So that is going to do it here for qualifying. And now, after what we saw last time uh, from the land down under, what does the land of the rising sun have in store for us? Here is our starting grid for the 25 minute race that lies ahead. It will be Max Butler taking us to the green flag action with uh, Rob. McGinnis on his outside. Dave Anderson, John Showerman, a row number two with Zach Hudson, Jeremy Clark, uh, the row number three, Kurt Panzegru and Hayden Fisher, row four uh, with Matthew Escajeda and Rick Sheldon, one and two in the championship, but on the edge of the top ten here today. Nicholas Leo and Joe Butler, they'll be on row number six, and just a couple of cars left to work our way through in this starting field. Small grid does not mean small action though, Nolan. And as the cars line themselves up for the rolling start, watch for the run down into the first corner. It is an incredibly difficult turn one. It's a fast sweeping right-hander that it switches immediately back on itself for one of the trickiest corners uh, on the circuit. That left-hander, turn two, also known as Williams. It is uh, definitely a corner these guys are going to have to be careful for. It's also a corner you really don't want to find yourself going side-by-side -side through. Well... Uh, unless you're in the rookie class, Nolan, which uh, in that case, it's almost mandatory to make sure you run side by side through every single quarter here. It's always nice coming to these free tracks because it means that everyone has had some sort of experience here. I mean, we do have a rookie in this field today, Nolan. Everyone else has had a decent amount of iRacing experience and, you know, pushed themselves out of that barrier. But for someone like Hayden Fisher, he likes running in this sort of private environment and very much thrives in the heat of competition. And you wouldn't have to, I don't blame him for doing that. I know a lot of drivers, actually, that do only race leagues like this. They don't race officials. So their stats in leagues will be impressive. They will be multi-time winners, in some cases, even multi-time champions. But they will only have a few official starts. So it's something 
very similar to that here with Hayden Fisher. And I think it's impressive here that Hayden Fisher, despite being a rookie on the IRC service, he is still able to maintain in the top 10 in what is an incredibly competitive field. And a professional kite surfer like to bring around his highly modified BMW M3 all across Northern California. He'll roll off on the outside of row number four. Interesting race ahead of us then. 25 minutes, and if it's anything like what we saw just seven days ago from Phillip Island, uh, keep on the edge of your seats and your eyes focused here live on RaceBot TV for round six in the Real Racers Virtual Club because the Porsche pace car is down onto the safety of the pit lane. The field is left in control of Max Butler in the 10 machine as we come down onto the back straightaway here at Okiyama and the green flag is out as three wide. We will go across the start finish line. I believe that's Zach Hudson trying to make up for a disappointing end to his qualifying. Single file, they'll work down in towards turn number one. Butler clear from the eight and the 13 by three tenths of a second. And it's side by side just behind uh, Zach Hudson. That's Fisher and Panzegru. Oh getting all sorts of messed up, and I believe Anderson has found himself back in the tire wall. A hard hit for Dave Anderson. It was a bad start from him. He was up in third and fell down several spots where he got to start finish line, was bouncing off the ramp when we were out halfway down the straightaway, and he just had significant contact with Hayden Fisher, tapped in the left rear, that sent him hard into the wall. So the 62 car out of this race already for the exit of turn number two. For the race lead, Max Butler looking for the inside of McGinnis, but no dice, so Robert McGinnis takes the lead early on. Just using that draft, no real defense from Butler as we come then down in through the double left-hander. There was some side-by-side -side action on the edge of the top 10. Anderson down on pit road, then straight away will have to take whatever repairs he can and roll himself back out onto track. Watch the RaceBot TV replay as the Hot Wheels machine, just a little bit too hot into the corner, are coming down into the path of, I believe that was Hayden Fisher in the three, and finds himself with the rear wing gone as a result of the new damage model, really taking no prisoners. Out of the final corner though, gap starting to build up between the eight and the 10. It's six tenths at the line here, but single file across the top 10. Pile indeed across the top 10. Who some drivers going in heavy defense uh, just behind them. Zach Hudson going down almost to the pit wall. Hayden Fisher trying to follow the close in the gap. You got uh, Chris Pensigar just behind. One driver running wide on the exit of turn number one, though. So a couple of drivers who are having some very interesting moments here. Fighting really hard early on. Definitely like we saw in Phillip Island. Nicholas Leo trying to run down Nick, uh, Rick Sheldon here in the 63 car. Will he have to look on the inside? He will. Tries for the inside. Will Sheldon get to the space? He does just barely. I think Leo might have cut the 63 car a break there. Here comes Butler as well, now in the draft. His brother's out front, but Butler on the edge of the top 10. Now to the inside as we work our way down this long back straightaway. A side-by-side -side puff of smoke in front of them. Butler to the inside, supremely confident, and it's Butler up into ninth. Uh, just that checkup, and like you said, Nolan, I think very kind uh, was Nicholas Leo there to allow the room for Rick Sheldon in the 63 car, and I think the championship leader be pretty glad with how things have gone still side by side leo trying to fight this one back as we work our way in through redmond oh there's a puff of smoke in front of them no. contact with rick sheldon the championship leader in trouble that significant contact there nicholas leo's lost his complete not just front wing but his entire nose cone as well rick sheldon is going to have significant left side damage because of that his side pod is all over the place Rick Sheldon just self-spun off one of those switchback hairpins and then, oh, just nowhere to go for Nicholas Leo. Rick Sheldon is staying out there despite having the side pod kind of flapping around in the wind. Nicholas Leo down to the lane, though, to get a nose cone change. I like the suspension damage as well. His uh, right front tire looking a little off camper there, to say the very least. Uh, meanwhile, up in front, you've got yourself a couple of cars involved here. There is Rick Sheldon. And you can see the damage on the left side kind of wriggling around just a little bit in the breeze. I think that is lap traffic behind. That's Dave Anderson, who is back out after getting a lot of repair done on his car. Two minutes and 40 seconds stationary for the 62. Take a look at the onboard look with Rick Sheldon. Rock and roll, but he's a little bit too much rock rather than roll there. Slides his way with the Hankook tires. Significant damage to the side pod, but doesn't seem to be slowing him down too much because Anderson is not able to close uh, as they head their way down into the breaking zone of the hairpin. Here's the battle between 8th and 9th. Escajeda chasing down Butler. 
Escajeda has won two races this season, but needs to try and find some pace here, Nolan, because these cars only be 10 seconds adrift from the race leader. And Escajeda getting a little close there, a little uh, too familiar with the grass just on the exit of the Hobbs corner. And now there is Joe Butler going way down to the right side of the racetrack, trying to break the draft. And it looks like Escajeda will not take the bait. He's going to stay up right by the left side, realizes it's still, still has quite a bit of ways to go in this race, still just over 20 minutes left. He's got time to reel him in. Oh no, something's happened again to the Hot Wheels uh, car of Dave Anderson, the 62 car back down on the pit road. What a torrid day for him. He'll be hoping that next time we head to the home of British Motorsport, Silverstone and the legacy layout there, have a little bit more luck slinging a car through Maggots and Beckett's riding on board with Escajeda down this back straightaway as Nicholas Leo has had some sort of an issue as well. Uh, it's a bit more of a difficult track than it would seem for, for these drivers to make their way around, Nolan. I'm not sure I necessarily thought that was the, the case. I, I really think Phillip Island is a technical track uh, to really get the most out of. You've got an interesting mix of high and slow speed corners, whereas this one, it's a car stationary on the inside, I thought for a moment there. It seems like they're just struggling a bit more to get the power down as there goes Escajeda on through on Butler. Well, it's much more clinical, Trad. The corners are a lot more precise. They seem to be a little bit more carved out via stencils than uh, more carved out of the landscape like Phillip Island. They're a lot tighter, and that has a big part to do with this as well, as a lot of these corners, especially the tighter ones, they're happening over some pretty significant elevation changes as well. Look at the hairpin uh, of turn five, I believe it is, at the hairpin corner. That's one of the biggest pieces of elevation change right there. Downhill braking zone, the hardest braking zone on the racetrack as well. That's why we are seeing so many drivers locking up into there, especially on the inside tires, because they're leaving these braking points just that little bit too late. Uh, of course, this track really, it's almost, it's a struggle to run Formula 3s around here. It, on iRacing, it's definitely more suited towards the club cars. And here's the replay of the race start from the air. And wow, that was such a pass there for, I believe, that was Zach Hudson just barely making it through on the inside line, putting himself up into fifth. And, we're going to see Anderson's collision here through turn two if we keep with this angle here. Blue car on the inside is why that's going to tip around. There is Anderson. He's going to come on down, just tries to clear himself. No dice. I wonder if he just didn't get the spotter in his ear at the right point in time. It uh, seems as though like he just didn't, he wasn't aware of the car there. And so you, you rely on your spotter in that situation. And uh, one of the nice things that I think these drivers will appreciate is having uh, an always and a real time spotter. Uh, keeping them on their toes because what, when these guys are racing in the real world as Escajeda has an issue coming through Redmond that's the first of the hairpins the left-hander in the final sector uh, when these cars are out there on when these drivers excuse me are out there on the track in the real world no sort of assistance there take a look then at what happened to Escajeda just a little bit too quick into the corner rear end steps around on him no saving that one back to live coverage though and the battle for the race lead is getting close between Butler and uh, Manija's here because it's down just half a second between the two of them, Nolan. And now it is the closest battle on track as well. So the battle for the race lead is starting to hot on up. Max Butler really pressuring Robert McGinnis. We saw how fast Butler was all through qualifying. What can he do with the draft here all the way down this very long straightaway coming up towards the hairpin corner looking for the inside decides not to go for it. probably a wise move on butler to keep that one in line definitely would have been an optimistic lunge on the inside we saw how well moves like that panned out uh, at phillip island at the honda hairpin just one week ago through revolver and through piper max butler has got that better run by just the smallest of margins car is looking very in control as he right on board with the visor cam on the right side of the screen i believe it's the first time that um McGuinness is racing in the series, not in the championship standing. So if he can win on debut, what a, what a start that would be for him. Has to fend off then the wonderful Max Eru car in the background. He gets loose coming through the final corner. This will open the door for the 10. Tries to jink to the inside, but side by side at the line. And it's the pole position sitter back to the race lead. Just the smallest of mistakes from the eight car, Nolan. He will try to fight this one back, but the 10 will hold on through turn number two. Can begin his hang on through turn two, up under the curves, a very dangerous place to be. Max Butler still trying to fight the outside line, they're still side by side through three, cutting back through fourth to the Moss S. Will begin to try the outside line here through 
the uh, Atwood corner. He is going to try to go for it here. He's got to get a better run here off of that corner. Now he's going to have the long draft all the way down the straightaway. Back spot, it goes defensive. Again, it's going to look for the inside line as well. The eight car trying to have a run here all the way down for the hairpin. They are starting to catch some latch up in front, but will not be affected for now. So far, beginnings is going to hold strong with the inside line. He's going to maintain the race lead down to the hairpin corner. This is great stuff, and it's bringing in Showerman as well, potentially for third position. So you never know how this is going to uh, check out. And for those of you experiencing some technical issues uh, on YouTube, we are taking a look at that, and we will try and get things all sorted up and buttoned up uh, as soon as we can. Our producer, Hugo Luis, a former iRacing World Champion, will be working his magic to try and get things back up and running for you all. Uh, we will take a look then. Final 15 minutes of the action here. And it's getting close. That's the 769 in front of Haulers. We're still on the lead lap after having a bit of a difficult day. Uh, ducking and diving their way down the main straight. This is going to be a battle to keep our, keep our eyes on, excuse me, Nolan, because these cars have proven that you can run side by side uh, basically anywhere here today. Yeah, it's definitely a very tight situation here when you try to run too wide to these corners. They are starting to catch Dave Haulers here in the 769 car now. Haulers was not successful at setting the qualifying lap. Spun three times on three laps, and he is really going to check up the Guinness there. Just thought the exit of the Atwood corner. So a uh, tight wood there uh, for Haulers and McGinnis. This kind of almost throw for Max Butler, but I don't think he might be close enough. He's going to maybe try to have the lunch. No, decides to back out of that one. So Max Butler, he's doing a great job of trying to make sure that when he goes for this lead, it's going to be a clean overtake. Gowerman got checked up very slightly by Haulers. The gap between him and the top two is extended up to 1.4. Once more, we will jump on board uh, with Max Butler. And I said it last week, and I'm going to say it again. Uh, that car, the Max Eru painted Formula 3 that he's got wonderfully uh, multicolored Patrick design that really does look nice. And I know Max loves a lot of uh, the Japanese culture as well. You can see there's some inspiration on all that energy coming down into the final quarter once more. This is where the lead car had the mistake just a couple of laps ago, but no sort of issues this time around. And almost into the grass goes the race leader across the line, just three tenths of a second separating these two cars. The rest of the contenders starting to separate themselves out very slightly. 13 minutes left to go here, Nolan. We are approaching the halfway point in this race. Approaching the halfway point, indeed. 13 and a half minutes to go. McGinn is still trying desperately to fend off Max Butler just behind. That 10 car, and the way he's been pushing this car here, it's at this point a matter of when he's going to get through, not a matter of if. He's just got to get himself a little bit closer to be able to have that lunch. He's definitely doing a good job of filling the mirrors of McGinnis, trying to make sure that he, that A car knows he is right there and he will take any mistake that the A car makes. These two cars started on the front row. They were the only two pace setters, really. The gap to uh, row number two, almost half a second, and Showerman continues to fall adrift. Now two seconds separates him from the race leader. 12 minutes to go. If I'm doing the, the quick math in my head, uh, as we come across the line, we'll complete lap number nine. So therefore, we should have nine more laps to go here, Nolan. So in effect, the main passing opportunity that we've seen is down that back straightaway into the tight right-hand hairpin. So nine more opportunities then for Max Butler to get the run down into turn number five. Still has several laps as well. An estimated nine laps to go here for the race leaders. That is still significant time here for these Formula 3 machines. They definitely have got the time to make it work, but he has fallen back a little bit here. The gap back to about a half a second compared to the quarter of a second. It was significantly uh, for the last several laps here through the Atwood curve. So it seems like Max Butler might be starting to fall back just a little bit here. And for those of you who are able to still uh, be listening in to myself, Arjuna Kenkipati, alongside Nolan Rempel, uh, YouTube does ex appear to be experiencing some technical difficulties, but uh, we are well and truly rocking and rolling still here from the land of the rising sun. Hopefully you'll be able to catch this one on tape delay as well, uh, because the battle for the race lead is very much picking up. And uh, for all of you rock and roll fans out there, technical difficulties, not just something that uh, IT people love to rather dread to hear the sound of rock and roll fans and Paul Gilbert fans as uh, quick hands there from Max Butler 
Uh, Racer X and Paul Gilbert fans will be loving some technical difficulty, so I have no doubt that Rick Sheldon in his Eddie Van Halen inspired number 63 car will still be enjoying some action here today. The other butler has taken advantage of a spin from uh, the number two car coming in through turn number eight, the same place that we saw Sheldon lighting up the rears uh, in the opening stages of the race here. And Nolan, it appears as though the same thing is struck to Kurt Panzegru. Kurt Penzegru just having a little bit of a spin. Uh, thankfully, what did not collect any other drivers. He was really close to collecting Joe Butler there. Butler just barely managed to squeak through on the right side of the racetrack. That would have been a detrimental impact to the number six car. Definitely would have torn off the front wing, if not the left tire as well. So uh, Joe Butler, no doubt thanking his lucky stars there. His brother, Max Butler, though, still in this fierce fight for the race lead. That is starting to split apart. The AR Cash and Nicholas Leo, could he potentially have a say here in McGinnis' overall pace if they catch him at the wrong time? Gap is out to nine tenths of a second, so you never know if he can get some separation and some, some clean air in between him and that second place contender. It could look a slightly different. Here is a battle for fourth on back with Jeremy Clark, Zach Hudson, and Hayden Fisher. Also have Joe Butler four seconds behind. Lots of teal and blue here. Hudson was looking very quick in qualifying. Hasn't been able to translate in, into race pace just yet here. You never know. The tires, he might just have been holding on to them here. And with the final 10 minutes on the clock now, Nolan, he might really start to push to the limit. About half a second between all of these drivers, seven tenths between Fisher and Hudson just behind. So, hey, to Fisher, I think he's just kind of waiting in the wings here. Seeing these two cars up in front of him will start to do battle and potentially tangle together, resulted in yet another incident in this race. Uh, Jimmy Clark, though, is doing a good job trying to fend off Zach Hudson for the fourth position out there on the racetrack. So, this three way battle here for fourth, fifth, and a sixth, the final spots inside and well, the first spots just outside of the top five as well. Uh, this could be one of those fights that we see heated on up right through to the end of the race. As uh, up in front as well, we'll keep with this, but I do want to point out, McGinnis has now broken the draft from Butler over a second in front. 1.3, in fact, is they're working their way down into the hairpin, just like uh, this battle for fourth on back. I was thinking, by the way, uh, Zach Hudson, a fan of you know motorbikes, he would be interested maybe to come uh, here to Japan, but not necessarily to race around Okayama, but instead maybe uh, make a, a trip over to the wonderful Suzuka circuit, which of course has such a long heritage of motorcycle competition. You also have the other track that Honda built here in their backyard, Twin Ring Motegi, which has been used for IndyCar competition in the past, and now sees mostly Super Formula and Super GT action. Wonderful aerial shots brought to us by ATVO, the graphical partners at Racebot TV. And eight minutes left here. Gap out front up to 1.5 seconds. A Xiaomi has stopped through the final corner. And from third position, the 13 machine dropped down to sixth place. Not sure exactly what he has done to lose control of the white and green machine here. But let's take a look at the replay in just a few moments' time, Nolan. Jeremy Clark might need a change of underwear after that one. The 87 car was mere inches away from rear-ending the back of the Charmin as he slid back onto the track for spinning by himself. And there goes Ooh. Clark, big to the inside down the front straight and just barely pokes through. I think we need to try and take a look at the onboard camera if we can there because that was a close moment. Change of pants required. Uh, not just in, in, the, in the real world, but sometimes in the simulator as well. Oh, back to live coverage and from third position, Showerman, who was looking strong here in today's action, drops uh, down the field hall. Oh, quick hands and quick reactions there from the 87 car, Nolan. He scampers down to the inside and moves himself then towards a podium position. He has also had trouble, so Matthew Escajeda has also been uh, taken out of the race in the number one machine, so more drivers having some significant problems here. He is down at pit road for the moment, so... Uh, we'll maybe see if we can maybe take a look at what happened to him uh, just in just a few moments here. But uh, this battle for third, fourth, and fifth down the track is now starting to really pick on up. Six minutes left on the clock as well. So they've got uh, not too many opportunities to make things happen here today. Rick Sheldon, the championship leader, uh, running around in 10th position. Matthew Escajeda was second. And he will drop then to 12th position, maybe 11th if he's lucky. So... There are points on offer in an 11-round championship with two drop weeks. And for Matthew Escada, it's turn two. That's the difficult point, and he's hard into that outside wall coming through Williams Bend. 
and shame for him that his day will finish like that. You never know, may be able to get some repairs done and roll his way back out onto track to try and recover whatever points he can because 11 rounds, it sounds long, Nolan, but it really isn't when you're racing back to back weekly here in the Real Racers Virtual Club. Oh, absolutely. It's uh, far from an easy task to be able to race, uh, you know, nose to tail like this, especially when you got guys in these high power, or, well, low power Formula 3 machines. Bridge here live on Racebot TV. Delighted for the second time uh, this season that we are able to bring you coverage here. And it's all thanks to some wonderful partners helping to power this broadcast. First up, it's uh, Stefan Wilson Academy. Uh, Stefan is, of course, uh, in action this coming weekend. Uh, first try to qualify for the Indy 500. 35 cars whittled down to just 33. And then next weekend, if he makes his way in, he will be racing uh, once more at a track that he has been oh so close before. He is part of this league and likes to try and give some tips and tricks to the various contenders as well. The other partner is Merrick Partners. Uh, the high-end boutique car dealership specializing in Porsche and Ferrari. For all of your uh, boutique car dealership needs, visit Merit Partners for all of them. Uh, great to have uh, Stefan Wilson also on board, and I'm sure all of the drivers here will be wishing him luck as he tries to wrangle a Dallara IR18 at breakneck speeds in qualifying. One of the most scary things you can do in the simulator. Can't imagine what it's like in the real world. The side-by-side, -side, the battle for the third and final podium position. Heats on up here, Nolan. There's a puff of smoke from behind. It's all intensifying with four minutes left to go. This gap has continued to close in. Zach Hudson trying to pick up a podium position here now. That shower is just behind that green and white car in the back of her. He had a self spin off the final corner. Clark trying to fend off Hudson for third. Hayden Fisher starting to look around in the wings behind. He's going to try to go around the outside here of Zach Hudson on the switchback corner of the Hobbs hairpin. No dice, though, for Fisher and Hudson, but that little look to the outside compromised Hudson's exit, so he lost significant ground at the German clock in the third position. And Schaumann is, you know, dragging himself back into the fight here. You can see uh, the white and green 13 where Schaumann with LMP3 experience over the last couple of years hunting down the various contenders with four minutes left on the clock. So just four laps left, I do believe. Uh, the battle for the race lead is kind of stagnated. A uh, 1.4 seconds and counting for um, McGuinness and Butler as they work their way down the back straightaway. Who's going to get the run, though, here out of Atwood Curve? It's Hayden Fisher who likes to wrangle a highly modified BMW around the track, sometimes in the real world, trying to hustle a Dallara Formula 3. They're trying to close in on Zach Hudson in front. That's Rick Sheldon in the 63 Eddie Van Halen car, uh, slowing his way down to avoid interfering with this battle for the podium. No changes just yet on this back straightaway, Nolan. The move almost coming there. It's going to come down to the final couple of laps. Two laps to go this next time by Zach Hudson trying to close in still on Jeremy Clark. Not close enough to this time make that lunge that he might have needed up into the red man corner. He still has two laps to figure this out. So the opportunities are still very much there for Hudson. But Fisher looks like he's getting impatient behind. He has a bit of a send up into Hobbs and almost wipes out Hudson's rear wing. Now Hudson might get the drive here up the corner if he can get the run. Oh, no, he got that. Hudson spins, flips over wildly down the front street away by the pinball, sliding now on his roof. And Zach Hudson, just like that, hero to zero. And the problem was digging his tires into the gravel, and you can see the disparity in grip swarms that car to the right-hand side of the track, and up and over he goes. And it's uh, Nicholas Leo, Rick Sheldon, and Butler trying to get on pass. That does mean now two-way fight. Uh, very much for third. In fact, Schaumann is going to take advantage here, close the gap even further. So two minutes left on the clock, and we'll have two more laps at the line as well. The gap for first now up to 1.5 seconds. So on debut, the eight car looking good to take victory here today. Oh, and Fisher's going to try to launch you down into the hairpin corner. No dice with the number three car. That was definitely a big launch. Jerry Clark defending nice in the 87 and. Thankfully, did not get wiped out by that three. Now, that has put John Sharon just a little bit closer. Now, with the draft, what can he make here off of these final couple of corners and down to the front straightaway? And so the race leaders are already coming through the final corner. So don't know if we're going to get one more lap or not. It is oh so close on the timing sheet because across the line goes 
and McGuinness, and it was 1.24 left on the clock, so it might be white flag in the air, but we will only know at the conclusion of the next 3.8 kilometers, so the battle for third might come down to this final lap, but who knows, it's all in the hands of the race leader. Two seconds clear of Butler, he might just decide to slow down the pace. Oh, Jeremy Clark has to fend off Hayden Fisher and John Schaumann. Schaumann was loose before. What can he do? Closing his way in through Moss Corner. Just eight tenths of a second separating these three cars. Important run out of Atwood Curve. 50 seconds left on the clock. Fisher sends it deep. Don't think he's going to get the run here, but he's got the draft. This is the longest run these cars have as well. Into the deepest braking zone on the track. It's the hairpin. And here comes the move, I do think, from Hayden Fisher, a professional kite surfer in the real world. The 87 goes defensive, Nolan, covers off the move, nothing doing there. Hayden Fisher was not close to make that dive, but he's got a tighter apex that time by. Right through one of those first corners through Homer, now through Piper. This is the final big boat run here that he's going to have up through Piper and down for Redwood. Right side of the screen, there's the leader. This is what I was so curious about. Eight seconds and counting. Checkered flag in the air on debut. It is Robert McGuinness that takes victory here in the land of the rising sun. Oh no, Showman has lost oh. it by himself. He will have to settle for the fifth position. Oh, Clark will hold on for third. What a dramatic race here once more in the Real Racers Virtual Club Spring Formula 3 season. And we have a debut winner. A bit of contact after the fact, but I have a feeling they're all just in good fun, Nolan. And there you see third place passing by the now stranded first and second place finishers. And in fact, Sharman had to drop himself down to the sixth position, lost the spot in the midst of this as well, so dropped out of the top five. Did he lose this by himself? He absolutely did. Loops it around and backs it hard to the conquer barrier. Completely destroys the rear wing off of the car. And right there, nearly wipes out ninth place as well. Oh, what a disappointing end to his day. And that's, I think, what lost him more positions as well. Just so much damage. The car crabbing his way down into the penultimate corner. Uh, disappointing end there for Showerman. What a 25-minute race we had here. Just an 11-round season and not too many more cars, but always puts on a show, does the Real Racers Virtual Club. It's McGinnis, a victorious by 2.5 seconds over Max Butler, the Indiana native. Butler was strong in qualifying, but McGinnis just had a too much for him in the race. Jeremy Clark holds on for a podium finish there. Very interesting battle with Hayden Fisher. Uh, just six tenths at the line between the two of them. Joe Butler on the outside of the top five with John Schaumann in six. And Kurt Panzegru, the final car, finishing on the lead lap. Zach Hudson, Nicholas Leo, and Rick Sheldon. The first of the cars on, one lap down, completing the top 10 with Matthew Escajeda, Dave Hollers, and Dave Anderson rounding out the 13-car field. Importantly there, Nolan, our two championship leaders, they were separated by five points coming into this one. Well, they finished 10th and 11th in today's action. Which means the point standings are about to get a big mix-up here as Begittus wins his... Uh, one of his first races on the season, Max Butler is in second, so we're about to get a massive points jumble here as uh, I believe the gap will stay just about at uh, five, six points thereabouts for your top two uh, drivers there. The question is, how will this shake up here with the other drivers that are now going to be able to get a big point saw from this? And you caught something important there, Nolan, as well. The, the winner got the fastest lap on the last lap of the race, so a bonus point goes to the debutante. Uh, but post-race interviews, let's get into them right now. Don't think we've got the race winner standing by, but we got Max Butler, who had a very fun fight there, and, and Nolan Rempel, take it away. Well, Max Butler, you come home, second driver on the podium. You were so close in the early stages of the race, you were really pressured beginners to try to take away the race lead after you lost it in the early stages. Still, though, second place, not a bad points haul overall. Yeah, no, honestly, I'm, I'm extremely ex excited to come home second, and uh, I heard you say that Rob snagged the, the fastest lap, which makes me kind of sad, because at least I was trying to go for that in those last few laps, but overall, I'm extremely excited to be here. Well, kind of look forward through this race, I mean, uh, it, it was definitely a gr an incredible run for you and qualified, I mean, every time somebody would just get a little bit closer to you, you would immediately destroy your own lap time by about three tenths of a second, so... You were certainly on it through qualifying, and you made those guys work for it, but you were still able to come out on pole. So uh, 
What do you think caused you to potentially lose the lead there in the opening stages? Because you were looking like you might be the driver to beat today. Yeah, I uh, I definitely pushed really hard in qualifying because I know we have some super fast drivers in here, so I was just constantly trying to better my lap time. But uh, uh, going into turn one, I definitely played a little bit safe, and uh, definitely for the, uh, those first few laps, I uh, tried to keep my tires as on the road as possible. And uh, when Rob got the lead, I just basically tried to keep my car as close to him as possible uh, and pull away from John, who was in third at the time. Um, and we managed to pull, I think it was like a two or three second gap, and Rob and I started fighting, but John closed in, so I chose to uh, kind of stop fighting Rob and try to get that lead again. I just never had the run, unfortunately. But overall, I'm, I'm super happy with the race and uh, just happy to come on, on the podium. It certainly was a great run for you to manage to come out on top there with the podium. So looking forward here to the next race. Uh, it is definitely going to be an incredibly intense race coming up here at Silverstone Circuit. Not any Silverstone, though. The legacy version of Silverstone, the old 2008 layout and the historical Grand Prix layout from that. So a very different challenge here as we swing on over uh, to the other side of the continent. So what do you think uh, you're going to be able to put together for us uh, in your next race coming up here? Oh, man, I am going to need some serious practice. I am, uh, t not to lie, I am not very good at that track, so I'm going to be practicing throughout this week to make sure that I can keep pace with everybody else. But, uh, hey, I'm going to try my best, and we're going we're gonna to stay on the road and see what we get. Here, Max, anybody that would like to shout out for us here today? Honestly, uh, the broadcast. You guys killing it on the broadcast. I watch all of it, and uh, amazing quality. And, obviously, uh, Real Racers Virtual Club, thank you for putting this together. Um, and uh, having such a great community of race car drivers, not only re in real life, but sim racing. It's really exciting to watch sim racing uh, when the battling is so close. And thank you for uh, taking the time to join us uh, here today. Max, congratulations on a second place finish here from Okuyama Circuit, and best of luck next week in Silverstone. Thank you, thank you. So, Indiana native Max Butler there, second place today. Uh, usually behind a camera when it comes to a real racetrack. Hopefully, if he continues this sort of development, he can see what he can do just like some of the other competitors here and get increasingly involved in real-world motorsports as well. Jeremy Clark involved in an interesting battle for uh, the final podium position here, managing to hold off Hayden Fisher at the death. Uh, Nolan Rempel is standing by with the 87 car. Indeed I am. Jeremy Clark, you take it home in third position. A position gained for you, three spots on the day. So you started outside of the top five, and well, through some of the attrition in the race, you managed to come out in third, just barely weathering the storm against Hayden Fisher. You sure gave him a fight, though, in the closing laps. Yeah, I did. I, was, I kind of pushed him and let him get close so I could try and pull away from him a couple of corners just to just kind of get an advantage on him going into the longer straights um, and it worked out in the end. Well, kind of uh, look through this race. I mean, you, we at first you were fighting for what was the fifth position, I believe, uh, and that's how we thought it was going to go throughout the course of the race. Then, of course, fourth place had issues, so you managed to pick up fourth place. And then, of course, John Showerman crashes himself out of the third position, and uh, that saw you poke right through up into the podium. So how was your reaction coming here through these races and through those laps as one by one cars in front of you made their own mistakes causing you to move further and further up the running order you know one thing i've learned is just to stay patient and you know i think uh that's all i did today was just stay patient and run my lines run my race and you know if stuff happens it happens and that and today it worked out really well for me uh, i think consistency is key and i, I think that i was able to move up a couple spots because i ran a clean race decent points all for you as well of course picking up the third position you're still over uh, 60 points behind your uh, official points leader rick sheldon uh, after today's race but overall it's still a really good day for you and you're starting to slowly crawl your way closer and closer towards the top five do you think you'll be able to get a few more positions at the points here if you can continue to put together these great performances like we saw today yeah, I think so. I think we've got the rest of the season are really fun tracks that I have a lot of experience at. And so, you know, I've got, you know, high hopes that I'll, you know, finish uh, podium on a lot of those races and, you know, get more points as time goes on. And thank you uh, then for coming out and joining us here tonight, Mr. Jeremy Clark. But before I let you go here, who helps you to be fast in the number 87 car? 
you know, I have a coach, his name's Patrick. Uh, he's from Seattle, and, you know, we kind of go back and forth in the real world and the sim, so it's super fun. Um, Patrick Byrne. And then thank you uh, for joining us here tonight. Uh, Mr. Jeremy Clark coming home, final driver on the podium. Congratulations on the third place. Best of luck next week at Silverstone. Thank you. And we took a look at Jeremy Clark's uh, Ferrari 488 Challenge Evo in our pre-show. I'm a little bit jealous of that, but uh, I'm sure he very much enjoys uh, competing both in the sim, but in the real world as well. I think we've got uh, one more interview to get our way to. Just waiting for our producer, Hugo Luis, to try and bring in the appropriate person. We talked to Max Butler at the start of our post-race interviews, and I believe we are getting his brother, Joe Butler, in as well. So let's bring in uh, the driver that finished in fifth position. And Joe, interesting race for you there. Seven positions gained, so our biggest mover on the day. You had to make your way through some carnage there. Talk to us about this race at Okayama. Oh, man. I qualified like absolute crap. I was so bummed out at the beginning of that race, but to gain that many positions, I was like, I was slowly gaining my confidence again, and I felt it, like, underneath the car. Well, we did see a lot of people, I think, struggling here. It's a track that a lot of you guys, Joe, have that experience of, you know, driving around some of these awesome tracks in North America that you have, but two different challenges over the last couple of weeks. Phillip Island, the land down under, I'm sure none of you have ever gotten a chance to go and race there, and the same kind of challenge here at Okayama. Yeah, this is, uh, we, we've done Ferrari races, but that's obviously really different. Um, just turning points, braking, it's, this car is flipping everything on its head. What's this uh, kind of a season been like for you, Joe, so far? I mean, it's such a fun championship. Not that many cars, and sometimes you never think that that's going to produce the most fun racing. But over the last couple of weeks, uh, Nolan and myself have really enjoyed the kind of wheel-to-wheel -wheel action that you guys do. And just being able, I think, to, to learn from one another and, and try and find speed. You guys have a really nice community here. and uh, The competition just as exciting as well. Yeah. Dave and, uh, Dave and Rick brought us on. They invited us in, and we had absolutely no idea how to drive this car, and they've been giving us pointers along the way and uh, uh, like on how to be quick and how to be safe, um, which is the most important thing. It's really easy to just fully biff it in some of these turns, especially Okayama. So I really appreciate these guys uh, giving us all the tips and tricks that they, that they know. So crisscrossing the globe, that's kind of what we're doing. We went from... Uh, Australia, Japan, and now over to England. What do you think about Silverstone? We're going to the old version, the classic layout. I think for some people, they prefer that layout, especially that final sector. You know, honestly, I don't know much about Silverstone at all, so it'll be a brand new track for me. Um, I know uh, when I get the time this week, I'm going to be practicing quite a bit because, you know, for this one, I didn't have too much practice. Um, so stay tuned. Thanks for joining us, Joe. Congratulations then on fifth here today, and we'll see you then in seven days' time. Thanks for having me, guys. So that is Joe Butler, the second half of the Butler brothers that we've been seeing in action here. Uh, Max in second, Joe in fifth. I'm sure there'll be some friendly rivalry uh, between the two of them. I think we've got a couple more interviews as well, so great to talk to more than just the, uh, the podium finishers now. I think we're going to uh, get Matt Escajeda on board and Matt a bit of a tough day for you two victories on the season so far But finishing in 11th not so bad because your main championship rival was just up the road from you I definitely got a little lucky there um, I just couldn't gain all the confidence I needed especially after uh, spinning in those slow corners the 8 9 10 I think I just lost a lot of confidence that I kind of just couldn't get the feel for it after that but I got lucky in points and, and this really is i think an interesting track right it, it, it's free and, and therefore i think some people def may think it's not the most challenging but there's a reason why everyone who starts on iRacing racing comes to a track like this it really challenges you and especially in those traction zones just like you found out unfortunately you really have to be oh so careful and i think a bit more difficult than what we saw last time at phillip island yeah there's a lot of slow corners and you're a lot of wheel lock and car is so so light in some of those corners as soon as you hit the gas and 
It's just, it's tough. It's really technical. What? I'm sure you're looking forward then to heading out of a track like this, less slow speed corners. It's going to be just as technical when we head to Silverstone, but you're going to be able to throw the car around somewhere like maggots and beckets. Uh, we just heard from Joe Butler, not necessarily so experienced at a track like Silverstone. Uh, do you have some laps there, and how confident are you feeling seven days out? Somewhat confident. Uh, I just started getting used to the old classic layout before when they introduced the new layout, so that kind of sucks. But uh, I do have some laps on there, and I do know the layout, so and I do like faster tracks, so I think I should be pretty competitive next week. Well, let's see what the pace is then for you, Matt, in that championship fight. Uh, great to have you here on RaceBot TV, and I hope to see you again in seven days' time. All right, thank you. I'll be there. So Matt Escajeda in the one car finishes 11th here today in that championship hunt. See what he can do seven days time as we head to the home of British Motorsports. One more interview to get to here today. And it's Dave Anderson in the Hot Wheels 62. And not an easy day for you today, Dave. And I think, you know, we were talking about this with uh, one of the other drivers. A lot of you guys have experienced driving around some of the best tracks in North America. But over the last couple of weeks, we've been on a grand tour, first heading uh, to the land down under, now to Japan here in Okayama, and tracks that I don't think you guys have too much experience uh, driving at all. Uh, well, that's true. Actually, I, I didn't have a bad day. I got hit, but um, I was actually uh, driving quite well. I, uh, uh, you know, qualified third, uh, feeling the pace. And uh, once I came back on track after getting hit on the first uh, first lap, uh, and then I had some technical difficulties, so that's four laps down. Anyway, went out and had some fun uh, playing with uh, with Matt Yee and uh, trying to put down some decent laps. And yeah, didn't find myself putting any uh, any feet in any weird places. So I like the track. A lot of guys were like, oh, this is a weird track. But I thought it was challenging. It was a lot of fun. I, I, I dug it. I'm looking forward to uh, the next one. Well, let me ask you about Silverstone then, the, the home of British motorsports and, and the legacy layout. You know, personally, I do like that, especially the, the law sector. It just flows a lot better. But is there any specific reason why we're going to the legacy layout at Silverstone? Because a side-by-side -side action, that might be the norm once more here on a Tuesday night. Yeah, well, you know, that's what happens when, uh, as race director, I get to choose. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm older than the rest of these guys, so I get to, uh, I get to remember the old Silverstone. And it, and it was also a, a bit of a nod to uh, a couple of our British friends who've raced with us in the Real Racers and out on the track. Uh, I, you know, I just I love the old stuff. I really like historic racing, and so, I, you know, I, I dig the old layout. I, I, I watch a lot of stuff on that layout. So it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a tough one. It's going to, it's, uh, you know, it's going to really want to make you qualify well and try to stay clean and, and uh, stay out in front of people because it's going to be tough to uh, tough to get any passing done, that's for sure. Let's ask you a bit about your real racing background here, Dave, because I'm taking a look at the notes here. It's just telling me that you're currently racing a, a vintage 1967, uh, 1969, excuse me, Datsun 510. That must be a pretty awe-inspiring ride, given that's the car that inspired you uh, to really look at racing when you were a kid. Yeah, it really is. I, I picked this car up last year. I've, you know, raced in, you know, various GT cars and uh, open wheel cars. Uh, but uh, this was kind of the one that, that I dreamed about as a kid. And I always say that's that's what uh, car enthusiasts do when you get to a certain point in your life. You go, oh, I want to go back and, and uh, sort of pay homage to uh, to something that brought me into it. Yeah, and I went back in 1973, 74. I watched John Morton win the Trans Am Championship in a car just like the one I'm, I'm racing now. So it, it's a ton of fun. And it's an, it's an amazingly capable car. I mean, I'm, I do times around Laguna Seca, you know, one second different than I do in a McLaren uh, MP412C. So, I mean, that, that's, that's just how good the car is. It's pretty fun. That sounds awe-inspiring, and having having visited uh, Laguna Seca myself, I can't even imagine what it's like with all of the the ups and downs. A, a true roller coaster ride. Uh, great to have you here on RaceBot TV, Dave. Uh, thanks to you and Rick for all of your hard work putting this series together, and looking forward to seeing you guys in action in seven days' time. You guys do great work. Thanks so much, man. Have a great one. See you next week. So that is the final of our interviews. Great to talk to more than just the podiums here live on RaceBot TV. Time to start wrapping things up, though, Nolan. Second time live on RaceBot here on a Tuesday night, but we are officially halfway through uh, the spring Formula 3 season. On a grand tour right now, we've gone from Australia now to the land of the rising sun, over to England next time. I'm really excited at what Silverstone will hold for the Formula 3 cars. Oh, you and me both. It's definitely a track that, that is so, so suited here 
for those open wheel machines. So I cannot wait to see what we're going to be getting for us as we kick off the second half of the season. That championship fight, though, still far from over. And you can catch it all live on RaceBot TV as we work our way through to round 11 here in the spring season of the Formula 3 Real Racers Virtual Club. My name is Arjuna Kenkipati. I've been joined by the wonderful Nolan Rempel for today's action. Hugo Luis is behind the cameras as always but with live timing powered by our friends at timing71.org. Lots more action to come here on RaceBot TV. So if you're not already subscribed to us on YouTube, hit that red button and the bell next to it. It's the month of May and we'll have coverage of the 12th annual iRacing Indy 500 this Saturday, May 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. All building up, of course, to the next week when Stefan Wilson will hopefully be competing in the real world race as well. For now, though, it is the debutant Robert McGuinness in victory lane here at Okayama, and it's us saying goodbye live on RaceBot TV.